For you living in, in the house, were you always on guard and, and on edge and nervous that something was going to happen? I was, um, and for several reasons. Um, one of them being that there was a day where I wanted to go hang out with my boyfriend, but obviously me saying, hey, can I go hang out at the park with my boyfriend? I knew that wasn't going to fly. Mm -hmm. So instead, I asked if I can go hang out with my friends. Um, which they all were going to be there, but it was mainly my boyfriend that set up the situation. So, and I made sure to delete any text messages that I had with him out of my phone and had my friend, my female friend send me a text saying, hey, are you going to still come to the park? Um, and with that, it brought anger and he kind of in a jealous way, in a very weird way, he said to me, oh, you're just going to go and screw somebody. You're not really going to where you say you're going. You're really going to go meet a guy. And I had and thinking about it. I was like, oh, my God, thank God I did the did this the way that I did. And I showed him my phone and I said, hey, look, this is my friend. It's a female. It's not really a girl because her name was. T but I also had a picture of her saved as a contact. And. Uh, he was just, he, he still wasn't going for it. And he was really upset with me. And I was just like, you know what? Forget I asked. I'm sorry. And I went in my room. Um, and then there was another day where I remember I was sitting in the living room with him. And I was just hanging out. Usually I'm always in the living room by myself and he'll join me. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, if it's if everybody's in the living room or just hanging out, I usually am, I seclude myself and I would go to my room. Mm -hmm. But um, on this particular day, we were sitting and we were talking and he was talking about ways of making money. And, um, and in this particular thing that he said, he kind of mentioned, um, I can't really remember the conversation, but, you know, the long and short of it was basically he wanted to be my pimp. And he wanted to start selling me to make money. And he said, you know, we can buy you some shorts. You know, we can buy you some shorts and really get your outfit together, get a hotel room. And he just kind of started laying it out, saying that he would be the security guard and he would stand outside the door. And from there, I was kind of, I was in such disbelief, but I, that I played into the conversation because I wanted to see where exactly he was going with this and if whether or not he was actually joking. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is a thing that I feared the most. But it was, it, it bothered me a lot. But at the same time, um, I won't say that it didn't bother me, but it bothered me. But at the same time, it just kind of was another thing that I had to kind of create a scab for because I was like, well, you're already doing it to me. So, I mean, somebody else, I guess it won't be so bad. At least this way I'll make money from it. But it was just, it was, but it was still sickening. And I was just trying to rationalize it because I knew that if that day were to ever come, I didn't have a choice regardless. Um, mm -hmm. I saw how he treated his girlfriend. I saw the things that he did just to people in general. Um, and I mean, on top of that, I mean, he gave me weed. He allowed me to drink. So on most days, I, I was, you know, in a fog anyway. And if anything, that was the only thing that I was really grateful for in those moments. Um, and he even said, you know, brought up something about giving me some type of drug so that I can kind of like get through the situation. And I was just like, okay. And then I got up and I walked away after that because I was like, I was scared. I was concerned for my own well-being and just scared in general because I saw how he treated his girlfriend and I saw how he reacted to me wanting to go be with friends, thinking that I was going to go be with a guy, even though he was technically right. But it's like to see that jealousy in him, it was just like... I don't know what reaction I would get from him after I was after I slept with somebody else. Um, so yeah, so if I if that were to happen, if you were to start pimping me out, um, I knew that me saying no was never an option. That it was going to happen regardless. And the only difference it would have took 
was whether or not I do it willingly or I do it unwillingly and I get beat for not doing it. Um, because, you know, his girlfriend, the only thing she did was exist. And if she came home even five minutes late, oh, you must have been talking to that guy at work or you must have been trying to cheat on me or sleep with somebody else. And she would have to try to rationalize, like, how could I go sleep with somebody for five minutes and then come home? Um, so I knew, like, nothing we said or did really mattered. It was what he wanted and he got what he wanted. Um, he even made the reference to me one day. Um, I remember he was in the kitchen cooking, making um, homemade fries. And I remember walking in to see what he was doing. And he did something crazy and dropped the fries in. And the, it created a, um, a grease fire. And he put it out, start cooking again. And then he called me over to him. And I just remember him pulling me into him. And then he kissed me. And then he said, you know, you're like my secret girlfriend. And I was just kind of like, yeah, my life is over. Because at any point in time, it didn't matter what I did or what I said, what he wanted was going to be what he got. So it just depended on how you wanted to go about trying to get what you wanted. Were you willing to suffer or were you willing to just, were you willing to surf, suffer and be verbal or were you willing to suffer and be silent? And that's pretty much the path that we all took in that house. So. Okay. Um, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that's it so definitely fun. is. Um, what, what advice you could share with, you know, that 14 year old girl? If you are in a situation that you do not feel safe or you feel as though if you were to speak up and say something to somebody and you possibly were to get placed back into that home where you're not safe, run away. Mm. Run away and find someone that would be willing to help you and to keep you and then speak mm. up about what's going on. Because when I went back to Washington to go to court, I made, I managed to uh, run into one of my old friends from middle school and I told her what was going on and she was just in such disbelief. And she said, well, why didn't you say anything? You could have came and lived with us. You could have told my mom and she would have took care of it. And I just remember thinking I was just too scared to say anything. I didn't know if anybody really could protect me or not because he had Again, another crazy story where he beat up somebody because they didn't pay him back and they ended up calling the police and um, the police came and he knew that the police was called and was going to come and get him. So he sent me, his girlfriend and his baby out to go to McDonald's and they ended up pulling us over, not even a block away from the McDonald's. Like we're in the car and we're looking across the street and we could see McDonald's is right there. And um the police told us to get out of the car. We all got out of the car and I didn't know. They were telling us to get out of the car one by one. And when it was my turn to get out of the car, I turned around and they told me I had to turn back around and walk backwards to them. But in that moment that I turned to look at them, there was at least eight or nine police cars, a few sheriff's cars, uh, at least two or three sheriff cars, and they all had automatic auto weapons or a handgun of some sort pointing at us. And I just remember being so scared and they came over and they put handcuffs on me and they started questioning us about him. And he let us know, don't you tell them where I am. You have to say, you don't know. So that's what we did. We followed instructions and his friend ended up hiding him um, in their apartment downstairs when they ran back to the apartment and basically stormed through and went through everything to try and find him. And of course they didn't find him. And eventually I guess he went back to the guy, beat him up again, forced him to drop the charges. So the police would stop looking for him. And that's pretty much what happened. We never really saw the police again. And so there was another incident from a different person. So it was kind of like, well, what, 
what happens if I say something? Is he going to just run again? Is he going to even get caught? Is he like, you just never really know when you're in that type of situation and you see how much power somebody has. But then also, I just wish that, I just always wish that I would have said something to someone, but I would have did it when I ran away. So that in the event that, or when the police went to go and investigate him, because um, something I learned is that a lot of times what ends up happening is if there's no evidence of anything happening, you know, the, the person might get booked, but they'll later be released. So what happens when he comes back home and he's waiting his court date, you know? Um, so I just kind of wish that I would have, knowing that other people in that house were in danger, I wish I would have told her and got everybody out and then went and spoke up and said something, but while we were in hiding, your best mm -hmm. bet will be to go into hiding. It's gonna suck because you don't want to you don't want to feel like somebody has that much power and control over your life to the point where you have to live in fear and hide. But at the same time, that's your only option. When somebody is dangerous and your life is in danger or you feel like your life is in danger, you have to run and hide until you get the all clear. And that was honestly the best thing that I could have done because it took for him to already be in jail and me knowing that his girlfriend and daughter were safe for me to even call the police. What was it? I think I was 14 when I left and I think I called the police when I was 21. So that was probably about six years, 14, 15, 16, seven, seven years. So yeah, that was seven years later um, when I finally called the police and reported um, that he had raped me. So, so where were you? Again, he, I was living in um, Slidell, Louisiana, and he had moved to California because he was running away from something else in Seattle, Washington. So I just, when she, because his girlfriend called me one day and she told me what happened and I was just like, okay, now's the time. And I ended up telling her what happened to me and she was so shocked and she encouraged me to call the police. And, and that's pretty much how that kind of took off from there. But knowing that they were safe and knowing that me not saying anything sooner left her in a situation to where because he was trying to kill her in that moment, that led him to go to jail. And he was being um, he was being held until court. He wasn't allowed to leave. Um, he wasn't allowed to make bail to to wait out his court date. He had to sit there and wait for his court date. So she was safe to run to wherever she could run to at the time. And um, I was safe to make my um, to, to make my report. So so this happened. Um, they were in Washington. He was running away from something in Washington and mm -hmm. the whole family moved to California. Correct. He tried to kill her in California, and then that's how all of this came about. Yes. Okay. How how was that phone call, or did you just walk into the police? How was that process reporting it? Um. So I under so I understood that I wasn't able to just call nine one one. I knew that I had to get in touch with somebody in Seattle, Washington, in order to uh, make a police report. And I think I went about two uh, two call transfers before I got to an investigator that was that took my call. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of gave him a debrief of what happened, and he let me know that I was well within my uh, statute of limitations to report it. And um, from there, um, he told me that he would call me back the next day with a little bit more information about how they were going to proceed. And eventually, within by the end of that week, um, we were on the phone and I was going through every single thing that happened to me um, from starting from day one. Um, and it was on a recorded line. So it was just kind of. Um, it was scary. And it made me really sad, but at the same time, I felt good about finally being able to get that off my chest. Mm -hmm. Because, and I think my biggest fear was not being believed, 
because I remember there was a day, like a couple of months after I made the police report, I went out to the French quarters and I remember I thought that I saw him and immediately my heart jumped out of my chest and I was just terrified. And I was just ready to go home after that because I was so scared. But logically I knew he was in jail and he was in a state that he didn't, he wasn't even in the same state that I was in. Mm -hmm. So it was just, I, I was fearful, I was scared. So I can, I can understand my rationale as a child of not wanting to say anything. But even then, even with everything that was happening to me then, I also felt like I couldn't go back home. I felt like I didn't have that option because I felt like essentially like I was kicked out of the house and I wasn't allowed to return anyway. So I felt like I was just stuck there to endure it. So. So what was that process like the, from the beginning of you um, making the report all the way until the conviction date? How long did that last? What was the time period? And then what was that whole process like? Um, so from the time of reporting, um, I was assigned to an investigator from there, the investigator gave me a sexual assault. Um, I can't, uh, it starts with an A. Um, basically an individual that kind of helps you go through the process and gives you updates on what's happening with your case, what's going to happen with your case. Um, I can't think of what they're called. For it's the not an, and not an advocate. Is yes, it? it was a sexual assault okay. advocate. Yes. Okay. Like, All right. <laughs> so I was assigned to a sexual assault advocate as well. And she kind of walked me through the process of everything that was going on and what was going to happen. From there, I would get phone calls um, in between. Uh, sometimes I would get I would get calls for check in every week, every two weeks. Um, eventually we settled on once a month, I would get a call from her to check in with me to see how I was doing. And she would also give me an update on the case. Um, from there, I would say that from me reporting until me actually going to court, that whole process took about two years. Um, and then from you, re from you re reporting mm -hmm. for the first day of trial. Yes, that took, took about two, two years. Took two years. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> so all this time, all this time, he's still in jail, right? Or okay. he's still in jail. Yes. Okay. He was still okay. in jail. Um, because he was actually transferred from California to Seattle, Washington to wait until trial. Um and I would say and it was so crazy to me because within that year or so. Um, before, I, so within a year into the process, I ended up joining the military. I joined the military and I was in one of my classes and they were speaking about sexual assault and how the military, explaining what the military does, how they go about it and what they do to protect their soldiers. Um, and that kind of triggered me a bit because I was still going through the process of waiting for court to happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, from there, I kind of, I spoke with the instructor and let her know that it's very possible that I might have to go to court while I am in AIT. Um, what are the steps and what would I have to do to basically be able to leave to, um, to take care of that? Wait, wait what is AIT? Um, AIT is basically um, the training that we do after boot camp. So it's kind of like our instructional um it's basically like a schoolhouse where we learn what our job is in the military. Okay. okay. Um, and that process for me was like two months long. And for some reason, I was so convinced that within the next month or so, I was going to be going to court. And that wasn't the case at all, because I think it was May that I spoke to my AIT instructor about what was going on with me. And it wasn't until what um, February of 2018 that I actually went to court. So I had 
plenty of time. Um, I just, it wasn't until I got to my first duty station that I ended up going to court. So, which they all understood, my 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 leadership all understood the situation after I explained it to them and they were 100% on board and, you know, and they supported me. Mm-hmm. So it was a, a very strenuous process and it was a little frustrating because when they finally did set the court date, it ended up getting changed twice. So, because I think the first court date was at the end of January and then there was another one at the beginning of February and then the final court date got moved to like the middle of February timeframe. Yeah, I went to court and that process lasted for three days of testifying. Um, um, I guess I should backtrack a little bit because I was told that the reason why the process took so as long as it did was because um, it was seven years after the fact and there was no physical evidence that they were able to um, to gather to say without a shadow of a doubt that this indeed did happen. So in reality, it was really two years of investigation that was being that was being done. So, okay. So then, if they are investigating and there is no physical evidence, what are they investigating? Basically, it's your word against his, right? Correct. Um, so the investigation process really basically boiled down to. Um, his criminal record that he had and his um, his criminal record and his character, basically character, um, character witnesses to his personality as an individual in general. Um, so for me, I think a lot of that what made what, what allowed for the case to go forward was the fact that there was a high probability of something happening versus you know, this being an individual who has no criminal case, no uh, criminal record whatsoever, uh, nothing, uh, no criminal record. And, you know, somebody that was an outstanding citizen, like uh, he was none of those things. Um, I wasn't, um, I wasn't able to, to know what the criminal, I mean, what the character interviews were that he, Mm -hmm. that, that they did on him, but I do know that a lot of the um, a lot of the cases that he had for his criminal background did involve assault to some degree. I don't know if he ever had any sexual assault um, misconducts on his criminal record, but I do know they were all physical assault that he did have on his record. Okay. So between that and a judge and twelve jurors, you know, they were the the final. Um, the jurors were the final. Um, they had the final say in what was what they thought the process was or what they thought whether or not he was guilty or not. So right. right. So the the it was three days of testifying, right? Mm-hmm. Correct. Um, and that was between you and the witnesses and him, or was it just three days of just you testifying? Um, I testified for two days and then the witnesses testified on the last day. So it was his girlfriend and my auntie mama actually who ended up testifying against him. Okay. And um, he, his prosecutor, his defender decided that they weren't going to put him on the witness stand because it wouldn't have benefited him whatsoever. Um, but I think, um, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I do know, I'm sorry, but it was just, I think, with everything that he had already done and with my aunt being able to testify to how she felt that I acted once I came home after leaving with him, I think that was definitely the thing that kind of put the nail in the coffin. Okay. Okay. So she definitely saw a difference. Yes. was able to pick up on something. Correct. Okay. Okay. And then the the three days of testifying, was that the end of the, the whole trial period? At that it point, was. it was just three days? Mm-hmm. So, well, I'll say it was more like a week, but the week lasted into basically him being, um, him getting his sentence, his sentencing. So after the, after the three days of everybody testifying, um, the jurors were sent back to deliberate what they thought, and it only took them two hours to give a guilty verdict. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
three days later after that, I was, I got a video call so that I could be there for, um, for his sentencing. And he ended up getting 16 years um, and a, basically in a restraining order forever, basically. So he's not allowed to contact me. Um, he's not allowed to use a third party or anything like that to contact me either. But I was also told that once he finishes, since once he finishes um, his time, he will be being relocated back to California to serve out whatever time he gets for the warrant that he has in California as well. Okay. Okay. Yep. So. And he um, didn't get time served either. So. <laughs> that that was okay. Awesome. okay. How um how was that day like when he was sentenced? What was that day like for you? Um, it was a nerve wracking but exciting day because during the time that I sat in that witness stand, I did not make eye contact or look at him at all. Um, every now and again, I might, you know, catch a, gl a glimpse of him, but I never allowed myself to really look at him because mm -hmm. I knew the type of person he was and I knew that he would probably try to give me dirty glances or just something. And I just, I wasn't, I wasn't there for it. I wanted mm -hmm. to be able to tell my story and be okay and go home. And then that was okay. it. Okay. So where are you now? Like in um, your life? So as of now, I have a three-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a boyfriend, which is probably one of the more healthiest relationships I've ever been in mm -hmm. um, because it comes with a lot of understanding and forgiveness, um, which is great. Um, I am currently, so you have the first book of the multi-author book that I wrote or contributed to rather. I have a second multi-author book coming out in November, I want to say. And then hopefully not too long after that, I can finish my actual book where it's essentially a tell-all of everything that I've been through. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I do want to go ahead and create a podcast and, um, and just kind of talk about the, the effects of life as an adult. So a lot of the things that we don't necessarily think about um, – that our childhood traumas or the way that our upbringing, um, how it molds us into the adults that we are. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, as a child, I was never allowed to speak my mind, even when I was in a healthy environment, because then it was met with, oh, you're being disrespectful because you're trying to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. But apparently mm -hmm. I'm not saying it in a good enough way to where an adult can understand that I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm just trying to give you my side of the story. Mm -hmm. And before that, it was more of you're not allowed to say anything because if you say something, you're going to get in trouble and you're going to get it worse. And when I did speak up and I did try to say something to, to an adult about what was happening um, when I was being physically beaten, um, we all got in trouble in the house. So I was just like, okay, I'm not allowed to say anything at all. Um, so as an adult, I don't like confrontation. I usually, if I get in trouble with something, or not if I get in trouble, but if I, um, I'm not trying to say. So as an adult, I don't do confrontation. And I don't do, um, if, if I get into an argument where confrontation is had, I usually shut down and I don't want to talk about anything. Um, and then if I get angry, I apparently my anger is really, really bad. And it's almost to a point where it could be deemed as being abusive, but more so it's just a lot of yelling and screaming and just, I'm just trying to shut down this other person so that I don't have to communicate with them whatsoever about what's going on. And I would rather just leave the conversation where it's at and just pretend like it never happened to some degree. And so that's kind of the things that we don't necessarily think about that where the correlation comes in at. And I would say that my boyfriend definitely has had a lot to do with me understanding correlation between the things we go through as children versus how we are molded when we get older and how we go about life as adults. So, so do you realize you get as angry as you do? 
Um, I do. You but do. I also realize that when I feel like I am getting angry, that is my time to walk away. Okay. But with me walking away, I also understand. I also know that that means that the conversation is done. I will never revisit the conversation. I will never try to talk about it in a calmer manner. If it was left up to me, we would never talk about it again. And then that just be that. But I also understand that that's not very healthy. Right. So.